Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. As I've been building out my rental portfolio, I have a general idea in my head on how much money I want to make with my rentals and how many rentals I want to have. But Matt, you've actually taken things to a whole new level. You actually wrote a business plan before you started buying rentals. Why did you do that? I, I wrote a business plan because I had educational experience uh, from from college. Uh, my bachelor's and and MBA uh, really taught me how to to write a business plan, and and from there, it, it really made sense to to have a laser focus on what to do, uh, when to do it, and and ultimately make more more money, you know, in the long run. On the podcast today, we're going to talk about Matt's business plan, and specifically what I want to look at is the numbers that he used to build out his rental portfolio. Joining us on the show today from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, is Matt McCurdy. We'll take a real quick break. We'll come right back, and we'll jump into the interview. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified, and I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because the last thing you want to have happen is to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender and she'll pre-qualify you for free if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. Matt, let's start off with talking about where you are today. Can you tell me about your rental portfolio? Yeah, so I have a, a mix of single family houses, duplexes, I even own a triplex, uh nothing larger than that. Uh the makeup is is 33 buildings, 44 uh, front doors or units, however you want to call them. Let's go back to the very beginning. So when, when you got the idea that you wanted to buy rental properties, you mentioned that you wrote a business plan. So like, how did you do that? Like when you're, you're just kind of figuring out how you want to invest in rentals and figuring out where you wanted to invest. Like, how did you go about writing a, a business plan for that? Or how did you get started? Yeah. So I, I wrote a couple business plans at the University of Iowa for my bachelor's uh, degree, and then I I went on uh, and got my my MBA uh, degree as well uh, while I was in corporate America, and wrote it for a little coffee shop in Eugene, Oregon. It was just something made up, mm -hmm. uh, really not applicable to me at all. Uh, but about uh, two years after I wrote that, I kind of talking with my wife and, uh, you know, just kind of wondering about life in general, where I, I needed to, to focus in the future. And, and we came up with doing rental properties. And so from there, I already had that business plan. Instead of doing coffee, uh, you know, full service coffee, uh, donuts, breakfast sandwiches. Now we're doing rental properties. We're collecting rent deposits, uh, doing pet rent, you know, so on and so forth and, and just really changing it. You know, as long as you have a process, wow. yeah, as long yeah. as you have a process in place, it's, it's, you know, seamless. So it's, it's the plan you came up with for the, for the fake coffee shop. That's the, you, you just a hundred percent substituted, that coffee shop for rental properties. Yeah. Which that's sounds great. ridiculous, yeah. but that's, that's what so, I did. So now how has it worked out? Like as you, you've been doing this now for a few years, you, you've built up a, a, a good sized portfolio. Has the initial plan worked out? Yeah. Yeah, it has. Uh, actually looking back on it, uh, there's a section where you can do, one to three year goals, five year, 10 year, 15, 20 years. And looking back on it, I, I kind of laugh, but that's the only way you know that you're growing. Cause otherwise, you know, if you're in the day to day and you're head in the sand, you just look at it as another day. Right. Mm -hmm. But if, if you have a business plan 
to, to really focus in on what strategy you're doing, what your future outlook and goals should be, then you can start saying, wow, you know, I've, I've really done quite a bit. So for instance, in, in year three, I was looking at the business plan and I had already beat my five-year goals. And then, uh, you know, just now I'm, I'm seven years into it. And I've, I've far surpassed my 10 year goals. I'm uh, almost approaching my 20 year goals. So, uh, really a, a good person, you know, with business plan would, would start re, uh, recalibrating those goals and, and making them even further and, uh, higher, uh, for achievement, you know, in the future. Mm-hmm. So were you setting goals that I want to buy X number of houses a year or I want to have a certain cash flow? Like what, what kind of goals were you setting? Yeah, it was a two pronged approach. Uh, my main focus at that point was, so my first rental property I purchased was a single family house. So my mind was focused on houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, later on, I, I obviously purchased some duplexes and, and other investments, but initially in my business plan, it was how many buildings, how many houses uh, w- will I purchase? And then from there, uh, what is the value of each house? So I kind of said, you know, each house is going to be $100,000. I, I buy it and I renovate it for $100,000. I'm just using, mm-hmm. uh, you know, high level examples. And then from there, since I renovated it, it's going to be worth $150,000. So I'm going to have $50,000 worth of equity. And all while I have that equity on one side, the other side is cash flow. So my typical goal has always been for every property I purchase that there's at least $500 in rental cash flow. And when I say cash flow, I say it very loosely because really it's just the, you know, the, the rental rate minus the principal interest payment minus the property taxes and minus the property insurance the other variable rates uh you know capex uh you know crazy expenses that kind of come up especially through a hurricane <laughs> mm-hmm. that that comes through that isn't necessarily something i can control but with that $500 in margin i'm able to to keep that buffer and, and not be, uh, squeezed, uh, you know, if there are some things that come up. Okay. So you want to, after you pay the mortgage, your fixed expenses, your mortgage, your taxes and insurance, you want to have $500 a month that, so after a year, you've got $6,000 per property, but you know that you're going to have repairs, you're going to have vacancy. So, you know, you're not actually going to hit, $6,000 $6,000 per, per door, but that's, that's kind of the model that you're following. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So say out of that 6,000, like, is there like, a you know, so you're going to have some properties that are going to just make you $6,000 and you're going to get that every year with very little effort, very little hassle, but then you're going to have another property that's going to have a turnover or maybe have an HVAC that needs to be replaced. So when you look over your entire portfolio, do you, do you see an, an average for like an average profit that you make per door? Yeah, I, I never really look at that okay. because to me, I'm not hyper-focused on that. Uh, in every situation, you know, for instance, let's take your HVAC situation. I'm I'm working with a, uh, a preferred provider, is what I call them. Uh, I've I've bid it out, right? Like I I know how much a a furnace system costs. I know how much a, an air conditioner costs. If it needs done, let's get it done. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna not gonna just defer it because I don't have the money in the account. Uh, I, you know, that, that can be another discussion. I, I have cash sitting on the side for things like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's never been a, a, an issue of not having the money. Uh, but looking at it uh, expense by expense, you just need to have good preferred providers that, you know, 
kind of what the cost is going to be and you 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 know that they're the best at what they do they're the best price uh in the market and then you you can kind of sit back and and let them do their work uh and it's pretty easy Mm -hmm. you know from there as you're building out your portfolio the market's going to be changing you know prices are going up or maybe going down like the assumptions that you were making seven years ago for I'm going to buy houses at this at this amount, you probably can't get those same numbers today. So has has your plan changed over time, or did you factor that into your business plan? Yeah, th- that is a uh, a good uh, question because I, I didn't factor that in. Uh, to my business plan, I, I did a, a SWOT analysis, which, uh, you know, for those that don't know, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, uh, you know, within that, there are a number of things I, I talked about in that, but I didn't really talk about, you know, the Fed just printing sums of money <laughs> right. to prop up a, an economy that shouldn't be continuing to go up. Uh, back when I, I started this business plan was 2012. So we, we kind of all know what was going on, what the economic climate was, uh, in that, that time in 2012, I couldn't have dreamt what we're seeing in 2019, 2020 prices Mm -hmm. are just skyrocketing. Supply is, is way down. Uh, it has been very tough to find investment properties, and and I, I'm not going to just change my strategy because the market is telling me to. Uh, that's where investors get in trouble. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to continue to to stand by that that $500 threshold per property uh, and and work that. So the the key is just to try to get that price down or find creative solutions to 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 reduce your renovation uh, project. Maybe you you know you're stuck at a hundred thousand dollars for this house. the The seller isn't going to take anything less than that. But maybe there's some things you can do on on the back end with your renovation budget. Always looking for different flooring, um, different windows, different things to try to reduce your costs. Uh, you know, finding different uh, providers that that are able to you know give you a better price because you know you can basically flaunt that, Hey, I got 33 buildings and 44 units. I'm going to keep you busy with other things. So trying to get some better pricing, it's, it's really all about negotiating and and relying on those relationships to make it work for everybody. You know, it's, it's interesting to think about, and I, I know you don't have the answer to this and nobody does, but you know, when you think about being flexible with your plans, the prices have gone up, but interest rates are way down, say from mm-hmm. six years ago. So mm-hmm. when you look at, okay, well, maybe I have to pay a little bit more for a property, but my overall cost on a monthly basis might be the same because the rates are so much lower. Like you, 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 you might be able to make the numbers work to pay more because the rates are lower. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's something to think about. But um, the the rates being so low, I, I feel like that's got to be a factor. Or even for your existing debt, like being able to possibly refi some of your mortgages to to a lower rate, that's going to make your business more profitable. So it kind of ebbs and flows. Yeah. The only thing I can really count on is the next five years. And then from there, you have to reassess. Now, speaking about being flexible and being adjusting or in, and adjusting things over time, when you were first starting out, you were managing your properties, but then at some point you you got a property manager. How did that change things? Because that's an expense that you maybe weren't thinking about as you were writing out your plan. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a tough thing to do when you're self-managing properties. Uh, it's, it's one of the tougher things to do to say, Hey, this, this is my baby here. These are all my properties and I'm going to just hand them over to some property manager that, you know, really doesn't have the, the same type of, 
of level of care that that you would, right? No mm-hmm. one cares for your money uh, better than you do. Right. And that's kind of the way I looked at it. But at some point, you need to to kind of move uh, forward with somebody to, to try to get that done for you. Uh, because at some point you kind of hit a wall and, mm-hmm. and I kind of hit that wall in 2018 when I was saying, well, if I want to keep buying more properties, I don't have time to try to find properties and manage these properties. So somebody's going to have to take over for me and not to mention it's, it's tough because it's a new expense. Right. right. You, you, didn't, you never had to pay for that. That was just your time that you never really allocated into your your business model. So now it's a new expense. It's even tougher to take uh, because you got to find ways to to try to pay for that. Right. Uh, so it's it, it it's it's kind of a, a delicate balance. And, uh, you know, I, to say that I've figured it out 100 percent is totally wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. And hopefully I can, I can get it. You know, you, you look at the amount that you're paying your property manager and yeah, it's an expense, but you could be doing something else with your time that can make you even more money. So like, do, do you factor that in? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the, kind of to that, to that uh, same point, you know, if, if I don't have time to find more properties, the pipeline's drying right. up and yep. we're just, we're just going to remain stagnant. The, uh, the key is to, to t- be able to try to find more properties, uh, do other things, you know, heck, even have fun, you know, mm-hmm. live life, right. that type of thing. Right. That's, that's important. Right. But if, if I don't have a property manager managing that stuff, I don't have time for it. So, uh, you know, finding a property, buying it right, you're going to make a ton more money than, than spending, you know, say a thousand, 2000, whatever that bill is a month, you can justify that, uh, you know, with one or two purchases. Right. Before we wrap things up today, I just want to point out two big takeaways that I had from today's conversation that hopefully will help you. The first one is Matt's business plan. I don't know any other investors that have taken the time to write out a business plan, but I really think it's a good idea after talking to Matt. Matt didn't go into this thinking, I'm going to buy one or two rental properties and see how everything works out. He went into it with the mindset of, I'm building a business and here's how my business is going to run. Here's where I'm going. Here's how I'm going to get there. And I think just taking the time to think that through and to have a timeline of, here's what I'm going to do by this date. Here's what I'm going to do by that date. I I think that helped give him the focus to get to where he is today. And he said that, that, that he exceeded his goals, but I I think just taking the time to write down exactly what he wants to do. I think that helped give him the clarity to get to where he is today. The other thing that I really like is the way that he thinks about his cash flow that he rents the properties out for $500 more than the mortgage payment. And so he's got that $500 buffer to pay for any repairs, maintenance, vacancy, wh- whatever other expenses he's going to have with his rental portfolio. And I-, I think that's a good way to think about it. A lot of people will use percentages that they're going to set aside 10% of the rent for repairs or 8% for vacancy. But it's really just kind of a guess. Like you really don't know what the repairs are going to be, but having that $500 every single month that you're setting aside is a real number that's easy to wrap your head around that you have to set aside. Now, where that gets interesting is in Matt's case, he has 44 doors. So setting aside $500 per door over 44 doors is $22,000 a month that he has every month for repairs. Now, obviously, he's not going to spend $22,000 every single month, but whatever he doesn't spend, that's his profit. So I, I think that's a real easy way to, to, to wrap your head around the numbers for building out a rental portfolio. Well, if anybody is in the Cedar Rapids, Iowa area, or if you're interested in investing out there, Matt is a full-time realtor and he would love to connect with you. 
If you want to get in touch with Matt, I've got his contact information on the website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 291. I'd like to thank today's sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. If you are looking to buy a rental property, whether you're just getting started or you want to add to your portfolio, the lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge. She's a nationwide lender, and she specializes in helping investors buy rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or set up a time to talk to Chaley personally, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com. If you mention Rental Income Podcast, she will waive all the pre-qualification fees. NMLS 42056. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Make sure you subscribe. We have new interviews every single Tuesday. If you subscribe, you'll get notified as soon as they come out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.